This lecture was actually uh, initially meant to be given by my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Millihead, who for, for personal reasons uh, couldn't come and present it. So I've been asked to replace her. She has done an extensive uh, research on the issue of Man Ray's uh, hidden Jewish identity, and the lecture uh, largely follows in her footsteps. A man Ray, seen here through the focus of his camera, was perceived in the context of modernism as adhering to universal values. Such a reading was in line with his self-image, the self-image he wanted uh, to project to the world. In his wish to create, to construct his early start as an artist, you know, in his uh, self-portrait, he said, I quote, I made my first man on paper when I was three. Well, in this effort, he linked himself to the long genealogy of the artist as a genius, setting himself apart from his personal family. In this lecture, I will uh, emphasize the struggle of identities that took place between the artists public universal persona, that is Man Ray, and his hidden particularistic world, that of Emmanuel Radnitsky. Man Ray chose the name Man to proclaim his universality, thus replacing his birth name Emmanuel, a Hebrew name meaning God is with us. Apparently God uh, was to play no role in Man Ray's life and the art. The artist re rejected his ethnic, religious, and particularistic identity, recreating himself as a man of the world. It is the tension between the universal and the particular that nourished much of his creativity. According to uh, Ronald Penrose, he was uh, Man Ray's uh, biographer, he says, I quote, no one has ever managed to elicit from him the history of his family, which affirms is long forgotten and better so since it could only be a cause of embarrassment. In a uh, catalog entry to an exhibition held at the Liberie Cis in Paris in 1921, there is a mock heroic fantasy of his biography. And this biography, so-called biography says, it is no longer known where Man Ray was born. After a career of a coal merchant, millionaire several times over, and chairman of a chewing gum trust, he has decided to accept the invitation of the Dadaists to show his latest canvas in Paris. Man Ray's hidden identity by no means is a unique phenomenon. Man Ray's, uh, it was shared by other Dadaists two or three of them actually, Tristan Sarm, Hans Richter, and Marcel Janko will be examined in the lecture which will be given tomorrow at the Dostoevsky Library. There is a common denominator among the Dadaists and Surrealists of using fantasy and masquerade to recreate their identities. Uh, Duchamp, you may have seen uh, this portrait at the exhibition. Duchamp chose the persona of Rose Selavie. Man Ray and Duchamp were part and parcel of Dada's rebellion against essentialist definitions of identity. But for Man Ray, constructed identity was a response to external as well as internal threat. And he made a concerted effort to keep his original name secret. Man Ray's uh, autobiography, self-portrait, hides more than, more than it reveals, and hence draws attention to that which is lacking. Uh, the author omits basic biographical data. As a matter of fact, no single member of, of his family of birth is named by him. Furthermore, 
he doesn't care to describe his home milieu, ignoring his socio-ethnic and religious background. It was only after his death that uh, Neil Baldwin, who was his uh, biographer, made up for the missing parts and traced the, the artist's family history, yet with no attempt to connect the artist's background to his art. Emanuel Radnitsky was born in 1890 in Philadelphia. Both his parents immigrated to the United States. His mother was Mania Luria from a village near Minsk. His father's name was Melech, a common Jewish name which stands for king. The family moved from Philadelphia, where Emanuel was born, to Brooklyn, New York, where his father worked as a tailor, both in a factory and at home, a fate which, which was shared by his mother. In fact, the whole family was uh, involved in this sweatshop experience, which included long hours, low wages, and exploitation. The children also helped out, and Emmanuel, the eldest, was in charge of making long-distance deliveries by a trolley car. We can see the more traditional depiction of the tailoring enterprise as done by the American Jewish artist William Groper, whose family immigrated from the Ukraine. Well, in this, in the enigma of uh, Isidore Ducasse, a man ray pays tribute to Lautréamont, Lautréamont's definition of beauty as given in uh, his uh, poem, Le Chant de Maldoror, The Song of Maldoror. This definition is beautiful as the chance encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a dissecting table. This aphorism was adopted by the Surrealists to define the essence of the encounter in the Surrealist poetic image and collage, the chance meeting of distant realities. Man Ray's assemblage is a mystifying, sinister creation consisting of a coarse fabric, in the early version, uh, an army blanket, enveloping a vaguely anthropomorphic form and tied with a rope. Due to the disparity between the title of the work and the assemblage itself, Man Ray, who perceived himself as being mysterious, engages the spectator's gaze in a sophisticated game of hide and seek. The artist is playing here a dual role. By adopting Lot Ramon's definition of beauty, he does offer us a clue to what he had called his opaque world. The image is indeed opaque, but the title helps us decipher what lies behind the scene, behind the blanket. It is not by chance that out of all the images in Lot Ramon's work, Man Ray chose one which involves a mystification of the sewing machine. It can be con uh, contextualized in reference to the world the artist was escaping from, but in which he apparently left some clues for the spectator. Our assumption is that the enigma of Isidodicas is a condensation of two layers of the artist's identity, Emmanuel Rodnitsky and Man Ray. A universal reading of the uncanny image shows that the blanket resembles a womb-like sack. In it we see an outline of an embryonic man, Man Ray. It encompasses a sadistic love scene between the pointed male rod of the umbrella, which falls prey to the teeth of the sewing machine on the dissecting table, a typical surrealist vagina dentata. <laughs> Should I? <laughs> well, we have a love scene here. There is a, the surrealist often refer to the, to the power of this aphorism as one deriving from the from the sexual uh, symbols involved which is the sewing machine is a, generally a symbol for the female and the umbrella mm -hmm. is a symbol for the man. So the love scene, this sadistic scene, is one in which the male, the umbrella, is actually uh, held, eaten up by the teeth of the, 
of the sewing machine, which is like a uh, vagina dentata. Mm -hmm. So birth here is here a cruel process involving, involving dissection. The entire cycle of existence is telescoped here. The birth or unveiling of man entails his death. A particularistic reading of the assemblage takes us back to the artist's childhood, where home was also a working place in which were made clothes for the garment industry. Uh, Lotteramont uses unique definition of beauty to describe a young boy. The assemblage evokes Man Ray's memories of himself as a young Emmanuel participating in the sweatshop experience. A mixed memory, it is part and parcel of the Jewish-American immigrant experience in a working-class environment. But it is, uh, it is also one in which he was introduced to inspiring fabrics and shapes, as well as to sewing machines and flat irons, which became an integral part of his work as an artist. Tapestry, 1911, is an early ex example showing the creative impact the Radnitsky household had on his art. It consists of a patchwork of fabric scraps in a variety of colors and shapes, the center of which can be read as an abstract shape of a human figure representing man. In the enigma of Isidore Ducasse, Man Ray mystifies his home experience. The army blanket denotes a cover-up, a metonym for his sense of shame. The, the word, the, the root of the word shame means to hide, to cover oneself, which is the natural expression of shame. In Hebrew, the term for shame, busha, is the same etymology as the word for one's private parts, mevushim. And the same root was used also in Genesis in the context of Adam and Eve's sense of exposure after the fall. Thus, hiding is intrinsic to and inseparable from the concept of shame. By covering the sewing machine with a blanket, yet informing the viewer that the sewing machine is there, Man Ray both covers and uncovers his socioeconomic Jewish background. The enigma of Isidore Dukas is actually the enigma of Emmanuel Radnitsky, covered by Man Ray's need to hide his original identity. The assemblage, a farewell to his background, was conceived in terms of baggage, both physical and metaphorical. Wrapped up and tied with a rope, it was ready to be carried. It was done in America prior to the artist's departure for Paris in July 1921. As Man Ray wrote to Tristan Tsara, in an intentionally self-contradictory manner. Yeah, he wrote, Dada cannot live in New York. All New York is Dada and will not tolerate a rival, will not notice Dada. Indeed, he needed to get away from New York to separate himself from the city in order to be noticed. A Paris symbolized freedom and the ability to extend his artistic identity, just as for Duchamp, in going in the opposite direction, New York had earlier played a parallel role. Cadeau, gift, the first work Man Ray made in Paris echoes the world he had left behind. It's a, it is a glaringly hostile offering from an immigrant son. The nail-studded flat iron could tear rather than smooth out a piece of cloth or garment. I should add that uh, Duchamp, who enjoyed making all kind of provocative uh, uh, sayings, once uh, spoke about using Rembrandt as a uh, ironing board. So I just, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to put Rembrandt there and use uh, uh, Man Ray's uh, flat iron. But to return to the flat iron, its aggressive presence expresses a Man Ray's attitude to clothing but his art reveals how agonizing this, this tearing of, or tearing, tearing himself from, the past proved to be. Apparently, variations of the enigma of Isidore Ducasse and uh, Cadeau became leitmotifs in Man, in Man Ray's art. 
Uh, for instance, you can see on the left the, the way that uh, in a rheograph from 1931, the way that the flat iron actually dematerializes. And, under, uh, um, and here you can see also a, a, flat, a red flat, uh, flat iron, which conveys a sense of danger. Similarly, Man Ray was to reuse the sewing machine and umbrella. In a 1933 image, he stripped the two, uh, the two objects from the cover and placed them side by side. In a related work, Enquête, or Inquiry, done in the same year, which is a photo collage containing elements of these images, the uncovered sewing machine and umbrella are lying on an actual dissecting table and if the artist identified himself with the objects hidden under the blanket, then here actually he seems to uh, dissect or deconstruct himself by laying himself open on the uh, dissecting table, on the table used by uh, doctors for surgery. Actually, I think that the dissecting table is taken from a uh, advertisement for surgeons' uh, utensils, things used by doctors. Exposure amounts to an act of demystification, that which was hidden becomes revealed. And yet, two years later, Man Ray put a bundle of objects in a paper bag, tying it with a rope, and titled it Enigma 2, suggesting uh. that the sewing machine is there and also alerting the spectator to the possibility that he might be on the move again. So this is an object ready for travel, and one may, spec may speculate uh, whether the, the, the news from Germany following Hitler's uh, 1933 rise to power li lies behind the suggestion of a possible need to leave. Another example of Man Ray's grappling with his past is the mobile obstruction originally done in 1920 and redone by the artist in 1947 and later in 1964. Uh, Artur Schwartz, who was the publisher, and actually he uh, helped Man Ray create many of his uh, uh, objects again in the 1960s, he described uh, the artist's work progress on this, he called it graceful aerial sculpture made of coat hangers. So it describes how Man Ray added coat hangers to each end of the mobile until reaching a total of 117. They obstructed the whole space of his studio. The blockage had a definite, definitive symbolic significance for the artist who commented it would have been amusing to keep the game going and obstruct the whole universe. The, the, the lightness of the mobile is offset by the association of a family tree. It is a kind of a family tree in which the branches or hangers are getting in each other's way that is obstructing one another. So we can actually see it as an execution of his ancestors by hanging them by their own working tools. Thus, by applying black humor to everyday common objects, Man Ray strove to cast off the burden of his past, ironically continuing to cull his images from the, world, from the very world he left behind. Apparently, Man Ray was unable to rid himself of that background, as can be seen by a variety of, smallest, of the smallest objects used in the tailing, tailoring industry, such as pins, needles, threads that populate his art. Thus, his needle and thread, an illustration for, for Paul Eluard's collection of poems, Les Mains Libres, uh, The Free Hands, is a sophisticated drawing in which the thread suggestively delineates a feminine human shape. The woman's figure and the hairdo echo the silhouette of the artist's mother. An early pho uh, photograph from 1895 shows Man Ray's father seated on a wicker armchair holding the artist's little sister Dora, while the mother's slender figure is shown with her hand on little Emmanuel. 
the photographer Man Ray didn't hesitate to manipulate photo uh, photographic documentation according to the specific biographical information he wished to convey. So, as we can see here, the, the image with the mother is cropped from the original photograph. The father is left uh, outside the picture, and the only thing left is part of his hand, which you can see on the right. By leaving the father's disembodied hand in the cropped version, the, art the artist cunningly draws our attention to what has been left out. In the drawing, the artist's son, Man Ray himself, is piercing the image of the mother with a needle. By penetrating the image with a needle, Man Ray attempts to exercise the magical power his mother holds over him through the tools of her own métier, which ironically also has become his in some of the works. In a later, uh, later ready-made, Man Ray close up, fold up, well, you can see the title here, um, which consists of an open and flattened sewing kit with a pack of needles. The kit itself resembles a human head. It is as if the artist were thinking, my head is full of needles, or if you get a close up view of my head, it will reveal the needles inside it. From needles and threads, Man Ray eventually upgraded himself to become a photographer of haute couture. You can see here a, a photograph of Coco Chanel in a little black dress, a hat and string of pearls, a cigarette in her mouth, representing the new woman. And it might be noted that her slender, slenderness echoes that of his mother. It is in, intriguing, intriguing that when Man Ray talks about his entry into the Parisian world of high fashion, he describes himself mockingly, I quote him, with my bundle in a black cloth under my, under my arm, I felt like a delivery, a delivery boy. Thus he echoes his childhood chores. The highly ambivalent uh, relation to the past is further explored in Man Ray's film Emak Bakia, a 1926 film. Uh, Emak Bakia in Basque means, I don't know, but I've been told that it means leave me alone. In the film, the artist presents the metamorphosis of stiff white colors by showing a person ripping them apart and shooting the dance, and he shoots in the film their dance-like passage through revolving and deforming mirrors. Following this exhilarating pirouette to freedom, however, the sequence is rewound so that at the end of the end, the torn colors become whole again. It is as if Man Ray in this uh, circular movement is telling himself and us that the past is like a never-ending recurring experience from which one cannot completely severe himself. Man Ray photographed himself many times in the, 19, in the 1920s in various persona, playing with his own identity. Uh, we can see here a Far Eastern exotic fakir, an intellectual with a beard, and uh, spectacles, uh, but far and foremost, a Parisian with a black beret, an identity he craved for most of all. So I'll show this decollage. Uh, changing his name to Man Ray didn't change his fate. In the wake of the Nazi occupation of Paris, he bore the fate of Emmanuel Radnitsky and fled back to the United States, settling in Los Angeles. In a later work from the war period, The Collage, created in 1944 in America, Man Ray invites the viewer to play an active role in a game of decoding. The suggestive title intimates that the elements juxtaposed in The Collage lay bare hidden components of Man Ray's life in the past, present, and future. There is a striking visual analogy between the advertisement for striped shirts and the photograph 
of fondling zebras. The, the zebra family dressed in their stripes alludes to the family of shirt makers, yet another allusion to the artist's background. A physical closeness between the members of the zebra family even hints at the artist's sense of nostalgia towards his own past. That is for all his uh, eagerness to wipe out its traces. The, uh, the words, the words snow ivory, you can see the, the words of the snow ivory. I didn't mark it, but you can see it. Um, uh, associated with soap also suggests the artist's awareness that one cannot indeed wash away one's past. A, a significant confessional statement reads, my beard, my bread. It is divided in two parts, a handwritten line reading my beard, my, and the printed word bread. Marked in red. Um, both uh, words or lines actually are um, placed in a, uh, a uh, actually uh, they are uh, tangential, no, they go against the, the, the direction of the lines of the letter itself, which, uh, which serves as the background to this collage. That is a device that uh, underscores the code-like character of the artist's message. The statement is of particular interest in terms of the artist's identity and his preoccupation with his beard as a means of concealment exposure. In his uh, photographed cell portraits in the guise of different personas, Man Ray performs masquerades in which the presence and absence of a beard plays a major role. So the, the revealing phrase may therefore be read as his comment on his individual and artistic identity, or rather a comment on the tension between the two aspects of his personality, a pronouncement along the lines of I earn my bread by means of camouflaging or playing tricks with my beard. Back to the collage. Uh, block letters, S -H -H -S -H. Mm -hmm. adorn the lower part of the collage insinuating that something should be hushed. At the side, missing witness is printed. Mm -hmm. On the left, missing witness keeping the suspense with regard to both his identity and, na and the nature of the evidence. Now here I marked uh, three things. The handwritten section begins with the phrase on top, making the best, making the best, and six lines from top ends with the words, been sewing in. Okay, um, the bottom line reads, most tellingly, the true aspect cannot be hidden hidden for long in. The witness, it is implied, will appear at the end and tell his story. In, in view of the persistently ironic and ambivalent stance that Man Ray expressed in his art towards his family background, one is struck by the solemn tone of his old painting, Rue Ferrou, created in 1952. The austere scene takes place on the street where Man Ray established his Paris studio after returning from the United States. The painting is devoid of the artist's irony. What then could have brought this conversion? One cannot but consider the date of the painting's execution less than a decade after the end of World War II and the Holocaust. However, Man Ray himself would most probably have denied such a direct link. His studied emotional aloofness can be seen in his autobiography when he refers at some length to the events that followed France's involvement in the war and his own flight from Paris. He never mentions the circumstances that led to his taking refuge in America. Man Ray ignores the fact that he had to be on the run because of his Jewishness. Also, he remains silent, he doesn't say anything about the Holocaust. The poignant pitch and of the image shows that the artist's protective wall of detachment didn't hold. The painting is pervaded by a sense of forlorn mystery. 
It depicts a shadow-like dwarfish man with a cap seen from behind as he wearily pulls a cart down a narrow, empty street. Stylistically, Man Ray drew his inspiration from René Magritte. However, his wagon-pulling figure carries a baggage which takes us back to the enigma of Isidore Dicas. Yet, unlike it, the tone is no longer witty. For Man Ray, it is a post-World War and Holocaust image, and it stands in a direct contrast to the emotional aloofness found in his writings. The little figure seen from his back represents the artist carrying the burden of a larger fate, perhaps echoing the photographs of carts pushed by victims in the Holocaust, which were published after the Holocaust. The painting also alludes to the time when being the eldest child, Emmanuel worked as a delivery boy dispatching clothes made at home by a trolley car. As seen in this context, the lonely figure in the picture comes to impersonate a Jewish peddler destined to roam forever from place to place, a modern variation of the wandering Jew as an image of rootlessness. In uh, Rue Ferrou, Man Ray, the sophisticated, uh, sophisticated man of the world, nevertheless pushes his own enigma in the card and acknowledges, acknowledges his preoccupation with both his family history and his ethnic descent. Throughout his work, by means of his unique blend of irony, puns, ready-mades, and uncanny images, he distances himself from the past. However, he also leads us to uncover the true aspect of the missing, the missing witness. Moreover, in Rue Ferrou, he momentarily comes to terms and identifies with Emmanuel Radnitsky. Thank you.